Good morning, good evening. Good morning, good evening, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to the online youth consultation for the youth decoration. It's an honor for me to be here and to in this really important initiative to ensure this youth voices are being heard. And with that, we are really excited to hear about your voices, your insights, your recommendations for our governments to make bold commitments to transform education. We would like to inform you that this uh, session is going to be recorded and that we have interpretation in six different UN languages. In your screen, you can look for the interpretation icon. And first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Sofia Bermudez. I'm a young education advocate from Argentina. I work as an educational leader at Education for Sharing. I'm a member of the Argentine Youth Organization for the United Nations, and I'm a representative of the UNESCO SDG for Youth Network. I will be master of ceremony with you today, and I will be joined by Ulysses Berenghi, that now I will pass the floor to Ulysses so he can present himself. Hi everyone, it's an honor to be here with all of you. I'm Ulises, I'm also from Argentina. Uh, I'm a learning experience designer and I'm part of the SDG for Youth Network and a youth representative at the Transforming Education Summit Advisory Committee. So it's gonna be amazing to hear from all of you today. Thank you very much, Ulises. And now to start, we're going to share, uh, we're going to do a quick activity and we're going to share on the chat a link so you can participate on a Mentimeter activity. And we can hear from you. We would like to respond for you to respond, what does transforming education mean to you? So we can start with a really powerful, powerful question to for all, all of you. And now I'm going to share my screen so we can see all of your answers. Great, we, we have our first answer and it's education for all. That's amazing. And it's one of the things where we've been saying of the past events to, to ensure education can, everyone can access education and we are not leaving anyone behind. Well, we have really a lot of answers, inclusive education, empowerment, education quality, education for liberation, empowering young people to shape their own education and to have a voice in creating their education systems in the future. Whoa, such a powerful answers, making education accessible and equitable for everyone, fundamental change. Well, we are really excited for you to be here, to be participating. I also want to remind you that we, you can also participate on the chat. Uh, we will be saving all of your comments of the chat and there they will also feed the youth decoration document and it's really important I, I really love to see that we are all on the same page because a lot of your answers have to do what we are going to do today here that is we're going to ensure youth voices are being heard on the education transformation we're aiming for so now i'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're going to begin um, thank you so much for everyone who's also commenting already on the chat. And to begin, I'm going to pass the floor to Eliane El Haver. She's going to do some opening remarks. Eliane is our representative of the UNESCO SDG for Youth Network. So Eliane, if you're here, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Sophia, and welcome to everyone. So, to give you a During the 17th General Assembly, which will happen in New York in September, the United Education, assess attempts to regain pandemic related learning losses, reinvent education. 
and re-energize national and global efforts to achieve SDG 4. That can't be achieved without youth. Only by including youth in the process, stakeholders and governments will be able to transform the That being said, will assemble the on June 29, 2022, the first youth consultation on the youth declaration was held in person during the pre-summit. More than 70 young people participated and shared their thoughts, ideas, and opinions. The key takeaways highlighted the necessity of creating a framework for accountability, including young people in the process and having the countries commit to reforming education through opinions. The youth declaration is being shaped and influenced by youth and will include those from all backgrounds and settings. This declaration will consider the results of previous consultations as well as other calls to action and other materials generated in conjunction with the Transforming Education Summit. The declaration will be given to the Secretary General at the youth contribution to the Transforming Education Chair Summary. There's nothing for use without use. Cliche but accurate. There's nothing for the world's population without half of it, without the 52% who are under 30. To the youth, we must speak express ourselves and share our perspectives. We must communicate our opinions, even if they are odd, especially if they are odd. The future is not just in the hands of the world leaders, but also in ours. So please speak up. Education is a right, and no one has ever benefited by abandoning that value. You are the other half. That we can transform the world without. We know that you believe in us, and we believe in this important case, we believe that this joint venture between our innovation and your expertise will lead to the ultimate success we all hope to achieve. I hope this will be a successful conversation. Thank you for listening. You respect you. Thank you, Elaine. Unfortunately, your audio broke up a little bit, but I think the key elements of this youth declaration is about including young people's voices, and this online consultation has a key point a key role on ensuring that our voices, our perspectives are being included. Before jumping in, I'm going to share some ground rules for this online youth consultation that is already being shared on the chat as well. If you are not a speaker, please turn off your camera and microphone. When speaking, you will be allowed to turn them on. Please be respectful towards others, especially speakers. This online consultation is all about listening to young people's voices, so please do not interrupt. Aggressive and disrespectful behavior is not tolerated. If so, you will be muted or removed from the call. If you are under 18 years old, please cameras off and please put only your first name on the user for safeguarding issues. If you have any questions, feel free to write them down in the chat and the team behind the scenes will get back to you as soon as possible. The last session of this consultation will be an open discussion where we want to hear from you and your point of view regarding transforming education. In the chat, you will see a link with a Google form. If you want to be a speaker during the open discussion, which will take place after the intergenerational dialogue, please sign up there so we can have an organized and clear agenda. If you're not going to be a speaker because you don't feel comfortable or for whatever reason, feel free to use the chat function to share questions, ideas, and recommendations. As Sophia already mentioned, your insights on the chat will also be taken into account for the youth declaration, so don't be shy and share your thoughts. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Doris Michali, also an SDG for Youth Network member who serves as a youth representative at the High Level Steering Committee, who will moderate this amazing intergenerational dialogue. Doris, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Uli. Uh, my name is Doris Michali, and I'm the SDG for Youth representative to the High Level Steering Committee uh, Shepherd Group, and happy to see everybody here who has joined us for the youth declaration. Uh, I personally believe that for us to be able to advance change, it's a continuous intergenerational conversation, speaking with people that have been working on education continuously, and young people challenging the status quo to ensure that we transform education to meet the needs of the future. 
And with that, I'll be passing the floor and begin with our first speaker, Leonardo Garnier, who is a special advisor to the Secretary General on the Transforming Education Summit. And my question to Leonardo is, I think the question that is on every young person's mind, as a person that is leading this particular process, how are you going to ensure that young people are part of the process and not just part of the process, but part of the process in a meaningful way, in a way that we are also making decision, we are part of the decision-making tables. Thank you, Leonardo, over to you. Hello, Doris, a pleasure to see you again. Uh, and it's very nice to be at this second consultation of, of the Youth Declaration. Uh, I think the word the key word in, in your question is, is process. We see this transformation of education as, as a process and we understand the summit uh, not as the beginning or the end, but rather as a turning point in this process that uh, as we have said, ha has to have youth participation as, 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 as the essence. For starters, we have insisted that member states include young people in their national consultation so that your voices are weaved into the tapestry of, of countries' understanding on what changes and educational transformations are necessary at the local, at the national levels. We know, of course, that participation in national consultations has been unequal, uh, higher in some countries, lower, even negligible in, in others. So we are insisting through our resident coordinators and the UN teams to make sure that the voices of the youth are definitely included in, in those consultations. We also established direct ways for your participation in the summit through the online platforms. We asked youth directly to share their innovative ideas on what they would do or demand to transform <laughs> education. Uh, these pitches were shared in person as Transform Education TED Talks or streamed several times during the pre-summit, including at the ministerial roundtables and, and the Youth Hub, and now they are available on, on YouTube. I think they will put a, a, a link in the, in the chat. And soon we'll be learning the sending or launching the Let Me Learn campaign that will also establish channels so that young people from all over the world can make their voice heard in terms of how they see the situation of education in their countries and the world, and what do they mean by, by transforming education? In fact, you have and I met up precisely at the Youth Forum at the, at the Pre Summit, which created spaces not just for, for the youth, but also for provoking intergenerational dialogue between you and current political leaders, ministers, UN officials, stakeholders, uh, private sector actors, uh, teachers' organizations. So we all came into contact with, with young leaders to, to have very lively discussions. I think this intergenerational dialogue. And this mutual learning must, must continue through the entire summit process and, and thereafter. And, and here we find ourselves again today at the, at the second dedicated consultation on the Youth Declaration, where you have the opportunity to share your views and recommendations on how to transform education. We have less than two months before the summit. This whole process has been very, very short. There are opportunities still in these two months for young people to engage. Uh, as I said, national consultations are ongoing and we, we need young people to participate uh, in those processes. Young people will also continue contributing to the thematic action tracks. And in addition, we are planning a third consultation on the Youth Declaration in August, most likely on the 12th of August, which is International Youth, Youth Day. But in addition to the Youth Declaration itself, Young voices will be incorporated in the summit outcome, outcome document, which will capture the, the findings from the three summit work streams, national consultations, thematic action tracks, and, and public engagement. Now, is this enough? No, of course not. Uh, one thing that worries me in particular is that all these channels that we are using or that we normally use for these activities uh, are not equally accessible to all. And as a result, those youth who are most in need to be heard remain in the periphery of these conversations. That is something that we have to learn how to change. And, and I think it can only change, not here in the, in the internet, but right where people are. We have to support national participation of, of young people. Finally, I'd like to say that it is not for us adults to, to tell you how to raise 
your voice and, and be heard. Uh, you can think and come up with many different alternatives. Maybe the youth should take for themselves the day of the summit and make it into a, both a global and a local event where young people and students uh, of the world discuss their own view and their own demands for the transformation of education and, and claim to be heard. And believe, believe me, if you do that kind of thing, uh, the world would listen. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Leonardo, uh, for sharing those thoughts with us. And can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, perfect. And what I get from your speech is that you're going to ensure that young people are included in all the streams of the transformed education. That is the national consultations, the action tracks consultations, and also like public engagement by leveraging on social media. And I liked what you're saying that youth engagement is just not stakeholders like yourself creating space for young people to participate in the Transforming Education Summit, but also young people have an opportunity by leveraging on social media and the internet to ensure that their voices are heard. And that's a better space and a bigger space where nobody's really telling you how to share your voice, but you can share your voice in a way you think it's best for us to transform education. So thank you so much for those words. And, um, and we'll hold, we'll hold you account for the words that you just told us that you're going to ensure. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very happy this, yes, I'm very happy there's a recording so that we can, <laughs> we can have out this part. And in September, when we don't see ourselves featured in the summit, we could just remind you, you told us this and why are we not here? Uh, so thank you so much. So next, we're going to be talking to um, Mr. Stefani Gani, who is the assistant director and head of education at UNESCO and also the co-chair for the High Level Steering Committee, which is the body that will be receiving uh, the commitments from the Transforming Education Summit. And my question is, as the body that is in charge of coordinating education globally, and also as the body that will be receiving the output for the Transforming Education Summit, what is UNESCO doing to ensure that young people are not just part of the process as Leonardo said during the Transforming, the Transforming Education Summit, but even after, the summit to ensure that we are continuously part of the conversation on transforming education. Thank you very much, Doris. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, uh, to all of you, and a warm greetings from Paris uh, to you, Leonardo, uh, Yayatma, Kenisha, Olixis, Sophia, and all this uh, great community we have on the screen today. Uh, so. I try my best to 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 give you <laughs> an answer to this complex question uh, in a few minutes. Uh, let me start with the quotation I have in mind: "Not in about us, without us." Uh, I mean, I, I hope it sounds familiar to many of you, maybe all of you. It what uh, I mean, Rana, right from Lebanon, uh, just uh, stated that oh. the pre summit here in in Paris, and it's what uh, you want. I understand, right? Nothing about us without us. And that's why you are here today. And that's why you are so committed with Leonardo and colleagues uh, to make as much as possible this uh, initiative, this summit uh, and all the work we are trying to, to develop uh, before uh, between Paris and New York, and especially after the summit, uh, a real turning point in the agenda for education and for all, uh, for all of you. Listen, um, over the past months, uh, being so in full immersion in this process, I heard uh, uh, many, many young people say that they want to see real change, real change beginning uh, with uh, actively engaging youth uh, as leaders, partners, co-creators of the process. Uh, and of course, uh, the first part of my, of my answer to your question is that UNESCO is very much keen to make this happen. Uh, this is the, 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 the function of this consultation process. Uh, uh, this is the, the, you know, the, the work, the cooperation uh, we are having uh, increasingly between New York and Paris uh, with our colleagues. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank really Leonardo, the special advisor to the Secretary General, as you know, uh, for the summit. Uh, uh, Yayatma, the special uh, uh, UN, uh, UN Youth Envoy, and all those uh, uh, colleagues from other uh, partners agencies who are really believe uh, that uh, young people should be at the core of this agenda we are building. 
uh, nearly 500 young people are participating today in this process, in this uh, in this um, second step of the consultation process. So it's already an important uh, uh, achievement. There is some, uh, sorry, maybe somebody who's not muted. Thank you. And, uh, and I think this is uh, a good sign also of the engagement and uh, the way we are trying to, to, to reach out to the to the to young people, not only the the, the, the usual sucks, but I mean people who are already very much engaged with the UN. Of course, we know that 40% uh, of the world's population uh, is are aged under 25. So we have really to uh, to as much as possible uh, enlarge the scope of our discussion. Uh, try to reach out as much as possible out of the the system. And uh, this is uh, something we can do through the consultations, but this is something that you can help to do better and more in the coming months uh, before the summit and beyond. Uh, I think that uh, also this, uh, the first slide that uh, Sophia and Olixis were sharing with us, uh, uh, yeah, I understand that the first outcome of uh, the consultation are already very much meaningful. I, I just catch some key words, empowerment, uh, uh, education for sustainability. I mean, there are some dimensions that are clearly coming out from your from your uh, perspective, and uh, we try our best to push. But of course, the key the key uh, the key um, tool you have uh, uh, is the youth declaration. The youth declaration will serve. Uh, as the major outcome document to convene, convene young people's collective views uh, on what transforming education should look like. And, and then the question, uh, my question is what happens uh, now and what we have to expect uh, uh, happening after the summit. Let me mention first some commitment I may I can take today with you, and then maybe some commitments I can kindly ask you to take. First of all, uh, we will call on our member states to include the youth in proposed actions. You remember I mentioned this point in uh, Paris uh, uh, in uh, my interview uh, with uh, Minister Senger from Sierra Leone, and uh, we are keeping the point, and we are absolutely. Uh, reiterating this message. We'll also ask uh, the design and implementation of intervention will include the young people, not only as uh, beneficiaries, uh, recipients, but also as partners and decision-making table. And the second crucial point is about what I'm kindly asking you to commit and what we count on you for. We count on you to help uh, turn words into action and hold uh, all of us accountable. So this is a bit watching us, and this is a bit watching member states in their implement in the implementation of their action plan. We count on you to create uh, an unprecedented global movement uh, around education. This is a point that Leonardo has already clearly highlighted. And really, now, or never. I think we have to traumatize a little bit more. We want to see a mobilization as large uh, and the widespread as we have seen with climate change uh, these past few years and even more because education uh, is really the future of, the, of this generation and next generations and uh, cannot be something that uh, uh, you know, uh, should be developed uh, without your own active contribution. At the summit, this is my opinion, at least, we have a once-in-lifetime opportunity to come uh, together and to map a new path for education. It's about amplifying in, uh, young people's voice, uh, ideas in decision-making, also bringing out your priorities and to ensure that your aspirations uh, for the futures of education are brought to the forefront. So we count on all of you to help us make uh, this happen. Of course, we are putting all our energies, our efforts to do that, but uh, it's very much important that uh, from now to New York 19, uh, I think it's really 
eight weeks, not so much, not so long term, but we can build uh, still uh, part of this conversation uh, more open, more inclusive uh, than ever. And uh, of course, I think uh, the, the, the summit for all of us uh, must be the turning point for education. So the, uh, the, 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 the follow-up of the summit is very much about uh, focusing on the outcomes and making these outcomes uh, concretely uh, translated into concrete actions to be monitored, to be evaluated, to be measured, and to be really the key point for cool tool for accelerating SDG4. Uh, I think uh, this is more or less uh, uh, the perspective uh, uh, and the, the, the answer to your questions. Doris, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Stefani. I like the points that you have just brought out that for us to transform education, there's responsibility for stakeholders to ensure that there's meaningful youth engagement for them to ensure that there are spaces for young people to be able to share what are their youth priorities. And the youth declaration is an opportunity for young people to do that. So we say thank you for all the young people that have joined us today that are going to be participating in this particular consultations and other consultations to come. And we're also gonna hold on to your word by saying that young people are the key mechanism in holding stakeholders accountable in terms of transforming education. This is a political summit, and it's very important for young people to use what they have. It's important for young people to know that youth engagement also has youth responsibility in it. You need to go back to your country. You need to tweet. I mean, I mean, you have your phone, so you need to go back to your country to ensure that your national consultations reflect the voices of young people. The action tracks re uh, reflect the priorities of young people. And everything in terms of transforming education, even after the summit, is youth-led and has a youth lens. So thank you so much, Stefani, for sharing that with us and for your commitment to ensuring that young people are included not only in this process, but even after the summit. So now we're going to go to an, a young person, finally, <laughs> after talking to key stakeholders that are driving this process. Now we're going to hear from the voice of the young person, Kenisha Arora, who is the youth representative to the High Level Steering Committee Leaders Group. And my question to Kenisha is, is that one of the young people that are leading this process in the youth declaration, what do you think are the opportunities to ensure that uh, the youth declaration is meaningful? And also what are some of the challenges that you've seen in terms of meaningful youth engagement as we head to the summit in New York in September? Over to you, Kenisha. Thank you very much, Doris, for your question, and Stefania, Leonardo, Jayathama, and everyone else for their commitment towards furthering education and achieving quality education. It's a pleasure to be here amongst so many young leaders, and as your representative on the High Level Steering Committee, I'm very hopeful that the recommendations from the Youth Declaration will be well, well received from the members and ministers in our high level steering committee. When we think about the challenges and different opportunities as well for those recommendations, a clear acronym comes to my mind. You know, we always need our family to be able to solve these greatest issues and challenges. So the acronym is simple. We need the FAM, finance, education, and movement. Those are the three clear goals and opportunities that I see for us young people to start acting on now. It's not only enough for people and ministers and governments to invest in education, we need to invest in young people. That's only when we can truly have transformation. It's not enough to just say we are committing $50 million to education. What does that investment really mean for young people and the individual child who is facing different learning disabilities than their other peers in their classroom? To me, we might have bold recommendations and great hearts and passions. I know every leader that I've met is really ambitious about their dreams, but in order to achieve this vision, we really need to think and set clear measures of what it means to start achieving these um, visions and dreams. And so for us young people, it really means what investments do we want to see? What areas do we want to see being promoted, supported, and growth and improvement in? But also what areas do we want to see continued in terms of development and strengthening as well? And so for me, finance is clear. It's not enough to just say that young people are attending school because we all know that 
even though young people are in classrooms, they're not learning. And this is true for five to 55% of people in high income areas and 90% of children in low income areas where reading comprehension under the primary age is still not achieved. And so really enforced um, investment and strategic investment needs to be placed. And that's only gonna come from a lot of us coming together to innovate what these strategies look like. And the second part of our acronym is action. Action really is accountability. Today, we've talked a lot about holdings accountable. For everyone on the call today, let's hold ourselves as young people accountable because we might only be 40% of today, but we are 100% of tomorrow. And if we don't start working with one another to support our capacity building movements, our political ideas, then we will never be able to achieve the goals that we have and urgency that we all need to be instilling amongst ourselves. And so let's all act now with this urgency that we have, with the passion that we have, because without this, we won't be able to achieve and overcome the challenges that we all have. And I conclude by thanking everyone for the incredible work. I hope we can all come together as a young population and use, yes, the FAM acronym that I see on the chat right now, but also use the recommendations from the Youth Declaration to start this movement online. Our biggest strength is our social media, is our social networks, it's our voices. So let's start tweeting, as Doris said. Let's start posting TikToks. Let's start making a social media movement about what action we need and let's start acting now. Uh, thank you so much, Kenisha. I, I think there was a bit of a problem with your network, but we had very clearly what your message was, that we need to start moving towards movement as young people. We need to ensure that we leverage the tools that are as long such as social media to ensure that the strategic financing is action and movement towards transforming education. And I, I just wanted to say something after Kenisha has spoken before we go to Jahat about that. Uh, the, the value of this particular consultation, I hope for every stakeholder on this call should not be inspiring. I mean, it's very patronizing when every time a young person says that the only thing that you're taking on is inspiring. I think we are all tired of being inspiring. We want people to take the ideas we have in terms of transforming education and them actually working towards ensuring that we're involved in the processes of transforming education. And on that note, I want to give the floor to Jahatma, but I have to ask her question first, who is the UN, uh, the UN Youth Envoy. And my question uh, to Jahatma really takes um, text from my previous comments and what Kenisha has just spoken about. Jaazwa is the pa young person that is at the forefront of ensuring that there's meaningful youth engagement in this particular process. How is this particular youth declaration going to be different from any other youth consultation that have happened? I mean, it's been many times that we are called in spaces like this where we are, they clap for us and they tell us, thank you so much for joining. How is this youth declaration going to be different and not just another document that is going to collect dust in the offices in Paris or in the offices in New York. So we'd love to hear that from you because it's also a concern of mine. I hope that <laughs> you have a great answer to inspire this movement by us knowing that our voices are not just being heard, but they are being taken upon as action. Thank you so much, Jayatma, over to you. Thank you very much, Doris. First of all, let me acknowledge the role of you and this DG4 Youth Network in terms of leading us in this work and putting all of your voluntary hours and time and resources into really creating these spaces, not only for yourselves, but for your peers around the world. I think it's a very important question that you asked and something that you know we started also talking about at the pre-summit in Paris. I think what's different, what, why the Transforming Education Summit and this youth declaration process is different from those previous uh, elements that you were talking about, Doris, uh, I, I see two uh, reasons for that. The first one is we don't see the Transforming Education Summit as the end point. I think why most of these processes fail is because we do these massive preparatory processes that end up in a conference or a summit or a celebratory moment, and we think that's the end point, and we conclude everything and go home, right? But we know that the summit for us as young people is really the starting point to implement concrete action on transforming education. So we are seeing this as an 
starting point than an ending point so for for me your approach therefore will help make sure that this doesn't sit as a document on a shelf but rather something that is to be implemented number 2 is again something that you were talking about as sdg for youth network particularly with other education youth constituencies in paris is the need to have an accountability framework one of the um key lessons that i learned in my work as the un secretary general in war on youth is that we can have as many as policies and strategies and resolutions um, at the international level but if there is no accountability framework we will not see results because then there is no incentive there is also no pressure for policy makers to deliver so one of the best practices that i can bring from my work is when we uh, when we established the un's youth strategy back in 2018 we also introduced a scorecard to measure the implementation so now every un agency every un country team every year has to report back on how they are implementing the youth strategy and everyone gets a one page report card it has red it has yellow and it has green and we measure how much are each of these entities implementing and then we are able to say what they need to do in terms of being better next year but also learn from entities that are doing well in certain areas of action so uh, these two i wanted to bring as direct answers to your uh, your question doris in terms of lessons that we've learned that i think can be implemented in the uh, transforming education summit process now the youth declaration will also have a concrete output as leonardo uh, mentioned in his intervention earlier which is that it will be submitted to the chair summary of the transforming education summit and its content will also feed into the high level process as a collective input of young people to recognize that young people are not just beneficiaries but really are the uh, equal partners or full fledged partners in transforming education now in order for this declaration to be a powerful actionable tool with concrete results after the summit we need decision makers to not only support the youth declaration but commit in bringing its recommendations to our own work of education in organizations in countries in offices with a sense of urgency for implementation we don't have a lot of time in our hands so we need the sense of urgency to be um, included in the commitments that the policy makers will make in september when we talk about concrete commitments especially from the ministers and heads of state who will be in september we want them to ensure universal accessible quality education that is gender transformative that includes climate action human rights education um the skills that we need not only to be employable in the future but to be useful citizens who are empathetic who are action driven and who really cares about people and the planet we need concrete commitments as kenisha said on financing not just numbers we need to know how this money will be spent in countries in in communities uh, my recommendation for young people involved in the youth declaration process is to keep being strong advocate this is uh, the words that will be in this document leading up the september summit and beyond that don't be afraid of demanding for more ambition through this declaration and when necessary also to challenge the commitments that are not good enough your input matters and you have a right to transform education this is what i've been saying since the beginning education is not a favor that we are doing for young people it's on, not something nice we are doing for young people it's a fundamental human right and you have the right to shape how to transform that education that you are being benefited from and remember always that your advocacy must go beyond un spaces and international spaces we know that top down approaches don't always work we need to prepare the ground start conversations in your family in your school in your university in local governments in national governments in municipalities so that when we have the youth declaration adopted it can easily be bridged with the communities of support that you have built on the ground 
Um, so we had the first in-person consultation in Paris, the education pre-summit, which will set the foundation for this document. And I, I urge you to take this opportunity today and the upcoming global consultations and other national and regional consultations to speak up and share your ideas and bring the priorities of young people in your community and your organizations to the table. From us at the United Nations, and I think I speak for Leonardo, Stefania, and my UN colleagues here, that we commit to bring your ideas, your voices, and the Youth Declaration forward to the Transforming Education Summit, centering your priorities for education, particularly from the Global South. So from the classrooms to the global stages, we recognize you as our equal partners in transforming education, and we are here to follow your lead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jahatma. I think you are speaking about my favorite part of youth engagement, which is the accountability mechanism. And I know that Kenisha and I both sit at the High Level Sharing Committee, the body that will be receiving the feedback from the Transforming Education Summit. And I think I've been trying to hold everybody accountable. I think now it's my time before I give June the floor that I will also work with, within the SG for Youth Network to ensure that even with as young people like representing other young people there's an accountability mechanism to ensure that we are doing our best to represent youth voices and then the other important point i think that is the most important point in terms of the youth declaration is localization change really does not happen at the international level but it happens when we have this conversations in our communities in our municipalities in our homes so that everybody can understand what is happening within the education crisis and what everybody and the role that everybody will play in terms of transforming the education summit and as everybody has been keeping on saying during this particular conversation this is a political summit where we need young people to really push to really challenge the status quo to ensure that we are all working towards transforming education so thank you so much to Hatma for your commitment thank you so much Kenisha, Leonardo and Sister Fanny. And now we're going to be giving the floor to a, very, uh, a person that has centered their work in ensuring that marginalized young people are part of the conversation June. I can see that he has logged in. And because that's a very important conversation, how do we ensure that the people that are not able to access these spaces like we are, people that are not able to, that come from marginalized communities are also part of the conversation of transforming education? Because sometimes these are the people that have the actual lived experiences of not accessing education. So June, uh, if you can hear me, um, I hope I'm audible and you've been able to connect. Uh, it's lovely to see you here. So my question is, as a person who has centered their work in ensuring that education is accessible to people that have disabilities, to people that normally are really put out by the education systems all over the world, what do you think we should do better to ensure that marginalized young people are part of the conversation on transforming education? Because we have to ensure that nobody's left behind. This conversation should be wholesome and inclusive. So from your experience, what do you think we should do better to ensure that this process is inclusive? Thank you, June. Over to you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Now, I hope that you can hear me well or at least hear the interpretation well. Is the sound coming through, either directly or from the interpreter? Good. So I repeat, thank you very much for inviting me to this event and for the work, the wonderful work that you're all doing. So what I want to say is that I am someone who has disabilities of various sorts, multiple disabilities. And when I was little and at the age to start schooling, they told me that I had to be outside the educational system. So there were years and years uh, during which my family put my case forward to defend my interests. And eventually, I was able to go to school and university. What I was doing throughout that time has been working for the inclusion of all people with disabilities, whether they be girls, boys, uh, teenagers, or uh, adults, they should all be in education. And so what I say 
is that disabilities need to have their voice heard. They need to be part of the education about transforming education and inclusive education in general. I think it's a mistake to single out and separate uh, children with uh, disabilities. I think back in the 90s, uh, there was the Salamanca Declaration that was about that. And that is the point at uh, which systems began to transform. But then what we see is that on the ground, in the field, in reality, inclusive education is something that is of importance for all students encountering obstacles in the system. So it's for all students that are segregated against uh, by the system and uh, those who get left behind uh, because uh, there is a very high number a very large percentage get left behind in all classes and this is not just about disabilities uh, but uh, there are myriad barriers and obstacles uh, that boys and girls find themselves facing whether it's because of language or because they are migrants or of different cultures that is to say that people from one and the same country with different socio-economic situations are going to find themselves facing various opportunities for learning in a traditional system and as our colleague said a few minutes ago there are so many children who are not learning and this jeopardizes their future because the system has not been able to meet their needs. We, so what we see that the right to education means a right to inclusive education. And this, I think, is what is set out in SDG 4 and our conventions on the rights of persons with disabilities. There is a lot of expert knowledge in this area that is available uh, to any state that is inclined to use them so that they can take these ideas on board in order to transform their systems and as young people, what we need to do is be vigilant and aware to make sure uh, that the system welcomes in everybody in one school. And we have to fight against discrimination and prejudices. There are strategies that are well known and when established in the area of disabilities and these should be extended and rolled out to, to all areas of education so that all of us can feel that we are included, that we are part of the system and should be where they are uh, because when we had the experience of feeling ourselves l in the wrong place or 
left out uh, and even risking being permanently thrown out of the system we carry this stigma and this suffering with us for the rest of our lives and therefore i would like to invite all young people and in fact everybody uh, to learn more about the strategies that exist for inclusive education and they need to understand uh, that we have to change our beliefs and attitudes and types of knowledge uh, so that we can actually transform education. Thank you very much. I am so grateful for you for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Oh, I was mute. I was talking on Thank you so much for sharing your perspective with us. And I think you have made a, a certain call to young people for them also to not only ask stakeholders to include people with disabilities, but also young people to read on what those strategies are and be the mechanism of accountability to ensure that people with disabilities are included in all spaces within the education system. Uh, so thank you so much. And also thank you for the incredible work that you're doing every single day to ensure that young people living with disabilities are included in the education systems in Argentina. So thank you so much. And thank you for sharing those outputs with us. So um, I think it's time for us to conclude this intergenerational conversation. And before we conclude, I'll give an opportunity to our speakers to be able to give us the last, I, this word inspiring, I have to use it now, inspiring words. Not even just, let's not talk about inspiring, but words of action as we head towards New York on how young people can be included meaningfully towards this process. Uh, so we're gonna start with Kenisha, then we're gonna go to Jahatma, now we're gonna go to June, and then we're gonna finish with Jahatma. So Kenisha, please over to you. Of course, thank you, Doris. I think we are the generation to make all the change. You know, we know there's a lot of inequities, we know there's a lot of barriers in education systems right now, and it's only us young people who are going to be able to even start to reimagine and rebuild these education systems. So we need to start now. Everyone in this conversation today, listening live or listening here today, we need to work with one another. Us young people need to enforce our capacity building strengths. We need to work together to reimagine these educational systems. And we need to urge ministers, senators, institutions, board of directors, board of trustees to be in places where all the decisions are being made. It's us young people who have the ideas and the will to make all this change. So let's start acting now. And please, let's all work together in a collaborative way and use the FAM acronym because it's only when we work with our families and recognize that we are a collective family at large that we can transform the world. Thank you so much, Kenita, for those powerful uh, action-oriented words. We're going to use action-oriented, no longer inspiring words. And we hope that the stakeholders here and the young people that are here that are going to be the world. Yes. And as we work towards the Transforming Education Summit, we're going to see more strategic uh, actions towards transforming education. Now, over to you, Yuan, for you to give your last uh, words in terms of what we should be doing moving forward towards the Transforming Education Summit and even after the summit. Over to you. See. Sure. Okay. I think. That including all the items and aspects that lead to the training qualification of teachers so that we can drive a change of beliefs and values is very important. Then we need investment in inclusive schools where we can have the necessary support provided to students that need it and also for the teachers so that they can feel confident and reassured 
and able to implement the strategies without worrying too much. So participation by students and the community in general is vital in terms of uh, defining policies at every level because we need to ensure that schools work with them and within their communities. So that means participation by students across all the bodies that take political decisions. And we have to ensure accessibility, whether we're talking about physical accessibility or having information and communication accessible. This is vital for people with disabilities and also people speaking different languages, whether they be migrants or because they come from a different culture that communicates in a different way. I think uh, this is really the crux of the matter. This is what we essentially need to drive the transformation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, for sharing those powerful words. Now I'm going to hand over to you, Jahatmer, for her to give her closing remarks. Thank you very much, Doris. Um, I think what needs to be said uh, has already been said by Kenisha and Juan um, and our previous speakers. So uh, let me maybe share a different perspective. Uh, I would also encourage all of you who are joining the consultations process to also use this as a, a learning experience, um, this consultation process, and really uh, learn from other young people who are here. I think we live in a world where Everyone wants to speak and everyone wants to let others know what we feel, but do we really take time to listen, right? I see already perspectives being shared from Nigeria, from Cameroon, from Sri Lanka here in the chat box, and I'm sure there will be more coming in, in the discussion segment. So uh, be open, be receptive to ideas, and that is the only way that we can come up with a common position that we can really push the policymakers to deliver. So uh, my, my plea is actually... Uh, very similar to Kenisha's. It's that as cliche as it sounds, let's work together because that's the only way that uh, we can be stronger uh, and be a force for transformational change. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to all our speakers, to Kenisha, to Ke Jahatma, to Wan, and everybody that has joined us to listen to this particular uh, intergenerational conversation. And just a conclusion to what every speaker has said, and I liked what Jahatma has said in our conclusion, our concluding remarks of it. Sometimes it's youth engagement at times, it's just not us demanding for the spaces for us to transform education, but us even learning from fellow youth on how what best practices on how they're transforming education in their countries. So let us be open. And as we go to the open conversation, be respectful of everybody's opinion and just be open to learn on how we can work together, as cliche as it sounds, and how we can all work together towards ensuring that this youth declaration is meaningful and not only meaningful, but also translates to action in terms of transforming education. So thank you everybody that joined us for this call, for Stefani and Leonardo at a particular time to come share their perspective on how they're gonna ensure more young people are included. Now I'm going to hand over to the master of ceremony, who is Uli, um, who is gonna continue uh, with the next segment of this youth consultation. So thank you everybody and have a lovely time. Well, thanks Dori and congratulations for leading such an interesting session. It was great to hear from all of you. Uh, before jumping into the open dialogue, I would like to acknowledge the presence of the African Union Youth Envoy, Ms. Chido Memba. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you on this online consultation. If you are still in the call, the floor is your to, uh, yours to share some insights regarding today's discussion. Are you there? I think they left so no well let's move on then uh, so now we will start the open dialogue the open discussion so Sophia will be the one explaining how this will work from now on 
Thank you very much, Ulysses and Doris, for this incredible conversation and your really powerful insights. Yahadma, Joris, Kenisha, Juan, and also Stefania Leonardo was really inspiring to hear from you and your insights on how to transform education and the role of young people. So as Ulysses said, now we're going to pass to this opening dialogue. And thank you very much for registering in the Google form we shared on the chat. We see that a lot of young people are interested in participating, uh, giving their insights and their inputs on the three questions we have today. But before starting, we just wanted to let you know that for each one of the speakers, you will have two minutes to speak. Uh, we will call on you so you can take the floor, then you will have the two minutes. And as you are close to these two minutes, we're going to let you know so you can wrap up on your idea. So without any further ado, uh, I'm going to share the questions so Ulysses can start with the first question and feel free to also share your inputs on the chat. So, well, we're starting with the first one, which is what are your views on what transforming education should look like? So I'm going to call first to share their thoughts to apologies if I mispronounce your names. I'm going to try to do my best. Shushmina Baidia, who is part of Youth Hive from Nepal. The floor is yours to share your thoughts. Hi. Hi. Uh... Uh, sorry, if I pronounce your name incorrectly, it's Ulysses, is that correct? Okay. And Sophia, hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think I'll, I'll just be very brief. Um, for, in my understanding, when I think about uh, transforming education, um, I think about how engaging that looks like. Um, it does not just comes with um, understanding how um, engaging pedagogical method we use in the classroom, but what happens after the classroom as well. How well does education interact with communities, with not just students, between not just students and teachers, but how the skills are transformed beyond the classes as well. So for me, when you ask about um, what does transforming education look like, it I feel that I think it should um, um, dig deeper into understanding the community's context as well, because at times we always uh, talk about ensuring basic primary level education to all, but we fail to understand what is the context or where is the young person or the student or teachers or anyone, any stakeholders engaged within the education system are, what are their current context? What kind of needs do they have? Uh, what kind of curriculums does it require? So when I think about transforming education, it's related to quality education, not in just terms of making it inclusive to all, but also understanding how well does that curriculum connects with the community? How centered is it to the community? And that for me is transforming education. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. It's really interesting to focus. And I think it's a thing of empathy and connect with the community and the people we are working on. Now I would like to call Edilson Manuela San Afonso from African Mozambique. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and share your thoughts. Thank you, Ulysses. Hello, everybody. Uh, so my thoughts regarding how we can transform education. Uh, we need to give access to the youth, especially here in Mozambique. We need to get more access from youth from the rural areas. We see that today we have a lack of a lack of interest from the government with the, the youth, especially when they finish the secondary school and they want to go to university. Major of them come to to the, to the capital to have to to do the the university. So if the the government has more access to them to the rural areas, build more university over there, it would be it would be a, a a great achievement for 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 the youth. And other thing I want to bring here is in inclusion and equity. So we can, with inc inclusion and equity, I think we can have more outcomes on, on, on what we want on the youth regarding to, the, to education. Uh, that, that's uh, what, what I thought. My, 
to, trans to transform education into access, equity, and inclusion. Uh, thank you, everybody, for letting me share my, my thoughts. Thank you so much, and thank you for both of you to keep uh, the time under two minutes. It's helping a lot, and thank you for sharing, talking about equity and how to create more equitable uh, education. Now I will call Celine Osunaldim, who is part of the National Gender Youth Activist for UN Women. So the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Um, as a gender equality activist and education transformer from Turkey, I'd like to start off with a Turkish saying, which is something along the lines of education above all. And I think the same is true for gender equality. That's why I believe that change should start from where young children and young people spend most of their time and in a way discover themselves, right? Schools. It is a known fact that there, uh, that there are um, steps that need to be taken in the education cur curriculum to make it inclusive, diverse, and definitely more equality focused. However, I'm not talking about adding the concept as an additional unit to the social studies course, no. On the contrary, the idea of gender equality should be embedded in the entire curriculum since we need to install gender awareness in children. Another point is that information shall not remain in theory. That part is very tricky and important. It is necessary to create a safe social environment and platforms where young people and children can experience what they have learned about gender equality inside the classroom. We need to ensure it is part of their thought structure. For example, the involvement of young girls in STEM studies is a topic that we have been talking about, about a lot lately. And in parallel, there has been a huge increase in the percentage of young girls who continue their education and careers in the STEM field. The reason for this is actually very simple. Girls need to know that they're believed in and hear the words, you can do it. So we need to support them in a tangible way so that they can discover their inner strength and confidently follow their passion with firm steps. So equipping girls with STEM and ICT skills will strengthen their self-esteem creating the opportunity for them to access information confidently to support their decision making and help achieve gender equality and transform education along the way. That is why we need to transform education and make it more inclusive while we're making sure that it is equality focused and there is a feminist atmosphere there. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really interesting. You're talking about a holistic approach and how to embrace and address the topic, not only as a specific subject or a specific topic, but throughout the whole curricula. Um, now I'm going to ask Sofia Kosik from ATD Fourth World uh, to take the floor if you're there. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Alicia, thank you, Sophia, for giving me a voice. I really liked everyone's posts that they shared. Uh, I would like to put uh, my voice on one strategic uh, point, how from uh, people who we listen to also at the ATD, a young people from 10 nationalists told us uh, that what they think is important. is like the major point, they put it on, if you want to transfer the education, we need to take a closer look towards Yaws that are in rural areas. What I would, I would see as a milestone for Yaws who get better education is to give them the opportunity to mobilize them towards better schools and education centers. What is more, uh, the Yaws believe that without connecting them to better and more futuristic centers of education and teachers to give them facilities, actually, uh, it won't be the changes that we will apply in bigger, in bigger cities and areas won't touch them so they will be unfortunately left behind that is not what we want to do and i believe if you want to tr make good transformation education it's really important to uh, make other people connect to this education that's why in in my slot i wanted to also say that we need to really remember to connect everyone to the changes we will make thank you Thank you so much and thank you for sharing the perspective from a rural community and from what are the needs from different sectors and different communities. Now I will invite our, I think, last speaker from this question, which is Foni Joyce, who is part of the Global G Youth Network, to take the floor. If you are there, feel free to unmute. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think from my perspective, um, 
with the Transforming Education Summit, what should really be uh, taken into account is effective partnership. And I think most of our, uh, our, our, our panelists have spoken about the importance of looking and working with the community. I, I, I feel within, for example, within the refugee community, some of them have already developed um, uh, uh, different solutions they're leading with within education. So I think, first of all, it's really important to recognize the, the role that communities have and really look at how do we partner with them to effectively change um, the system that has not been working. Um, I think the second thing and the last thing that I want to mention is that um, with the Transforming Education Summit, we all, they also need to get to the point of, yes, we're working through systems that have not work before. So really creating a space whereby the space for innovation and really looking at the digital space and how can we leverage those particular spaces to really transform education in a very in a very positive way. I think most young people don't want to stay, don't want to just go through education, then get stuck at what at, at a certain point. So it's really important to really look at at it at a holistic, uh, at a, uh, from a holistic point of view, whereby we're looking at it. You know, it's not only access, but then really the life skills that are really vital, and also transition to work, which promotes um, self reliance and dignity, which is really important. Thank you. Thank you so much and for addressing the need to train young people with the skills needed not to get stuck at certain point, as you mentioned. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on your on the first question. You can move also and share it on the chat as well. I saw already many people sharing it. Now we will move to the second question, which will be led by Sophia. But I'm going to share first the screen. Um, where is it? Let me know if you can see the screen with the questions. Yes, thank you very much, Ulises. Okay, then as Ulises said, we are going to go to the second question. Just please remind that you can share your thoughts and your insights on the chat. And thank you very much to all the amazing speakers that already took the Okay, going to the second question, that is, what are your recommendations to decision and policy makers, including governments, civil society, international organizations, the United Nations and others on transforming education? The first person to take the floor will be Agus Hassan Hidajat from Remisi and Transforming Communities for Inclusion. Agus, are you there? Um, yep, yeah, thank you, I'm here. I'm so sorry, I, could, I couldn't um, um, camera on, but I, I do really hope that uh, you can uh, hear my voice clearly. But yeah, uh, one thing that I really want to talk is actually about, um, uh, about uh, regulation or a policy that it's actually uh, discriminating a young person with uh, intellectual and psychosocial disabilities uh, in many countries, uh, including my country, Indonesia. So uh, we've got like a problem, which uh, some uh, like universities or uh, in, including inclusive education, uh, they require uh, um, IQ tests or uh, mental health certificates for person with uh, uh, psychosocial or uh, intellectual disabilities uh, that this one is actually should be uh, abolished uh, in many countries and also uh, we would uh, we would like to recommend it that uh, the action plan that uh, we are going to make is also compliance or also uh, um, uh, in the same direction with the um, uh, guidance uh, with the um, the institutionalization uh, draft uh, guideline uh, that uh, United Nation of the uh, CRPD of the or the Convention on the Rights of Person with Disability is actually uh, drafting right now. Uh, thank you. That's uh, what I want to say. Thank you very much. It was to hear importance and the emphasis on schools and universities, and also I think to what Juan shared in the, her inter, his intervention during the intergenerational dialogue. So now we're going to give the floor to Hector Ulloa from Norwegian Students and Academics International Assistant Fund. Hector, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sofia. And I'll just say sorry in advance uh, because uh, my 
policy issues I want to raise, I can't go through them in two minutes. And like uh, Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed said at the test pre summit, she encouraged all youth to take the word and open the doors when they were not allowing us. So I'll you do that and follow her advice. Um, I want to start with the general uh, comment on engaging with youth, because I feel like as we move forward towards the youth uh, declaration, we need to acknowledge that engaging is not enough. We need to transcend from having good motos, having videos of youth people, and having very nice and inspiring speeches to actually getting youth to discuss policy issues, which is something that we are lacking sometimes. Uh, because what we need is a lot of more political depth in the discussions that we're doing up towards this consultation. and. Uh, also, I wanted to have a reassurance of this uh, thing that was mentioned about this being an independent process, because if this is really an independent process, I want to encourage all the youth to really take a risk and for us to be very progressive and to aim high for those things that other member states that need to go through a consensus at the United Nations won't be willing to uh, do. And in line with that uh, taking risk is that I want to mention three policy issues which I think are essential in any uh, attempt at transforming education. One is about participation, who gets to participate in the discussions around policy issues. The other one is about financing, what we need to have better financing and education. And the last one is about curriculum and how curriculums are being attacked. So the first one, when we talk about participation, we have the biggest stakeholder group in education, uh, in the education sector, which is learners. It is students. And they are constantly under attack. We know from last year's Free to Think report that over 140 students that has been recorded in this past year have been sent to jail, have been expelled from their institutions, are being labeled as terrorists, or are facing just different kinds of prosecutions because of their engagement and because of their political activities. And at the same time, we see that when policies are being discussed, both at the national level, but also within the UN system, students are not being included as an independent stakeholder. And we as youth have a responsibility because in many occasions, uh, I bet many of the uh, uh, the people here are also students, I'm not anymore, but as students, youth are oftentimes students. And we know that the student movement globally is very well organized. They have democratic structures, they have accountable representatives, and we as youth have a responsibility then to push the United Nations to recognize students as independent stakeholders and include them in all processes through those democratic organizations that they already have in place. Because without accountability and without representativeness, we cannot discuss policy issues. The second one is regarding financing of education. We see now that after the COVID pandemic, we're going into a second debt crisis. And just to do some memory, the last time we had a huge movement to condone debts was the Jubilee movement in the 2000s. And that debt crisis led to a huge increase in private actors within education. And if we, it looks like we haven't learned anything from this. And as we are hitting a second debt crisis, we as youth need to ask for a complete ban of for-profit actors in the education sector, because we know that they are the ones that are going to take more space as we go into a possible recession in the next five years. So banning for-profit actors is a, a strong demand because the focus for education needs to be on good quality education and increased access for marginalized groups, not on someone making money, making profit from the fulfillment of a human right. And the last one that I wanted to mention was regarding curriculum, and it goes to comprehensive sexual education, which is something that we saw in the test pre summit. There was just one side event to talk about CSE or to talk about gender issues, for example. And that is that we see worldwide now that there is an increased attack on gender issues, gender studies, on comprehensive sexual education. And this is a very well-financed movement around the world that is trying to undermine LGBTQI plus groups' rights and also are trying to undermine uh, girls' and uh, rights to comprehensive sexual education, which we have seen through a lot of studies already that is one of the strongest liberating factors that can move uh, women into the labor market and just to fulfill their life uh, plans. So Excuse in this declaration, extra? this is my last Could point. You, I just yes, feel like we need to mention comprehensive sexual education. We need to mention gender studies and we do not need to be scared that some countries will oppose this if we are really going to put forward an independent, uh, an independent declaration that is really progressive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hector, for your inputs and your insights about the importance of young people to be part of the process, actually, of transforming education, not only be heard 
about the importance of financing to create structural changes and also about including comprehensive and sexual education in the curriculum. And now before passing the floor to me, our next speaker, I will remind you to please uh, try to, to stick to the two minutes of interventions. If you want to share anything else, you can also share it on the chat. And our next speaker is Nudara Jusov from Coalition for the UN, We Need and Global Governance Innovation Network. Nudara, are you there? I am, hi, thank you, Sophia. I, I'll, I'll just jump right in. So not to take up too much time, but I think when we talk about transforming education, there is the idea of increasing the baseline of education and increasing quality education, gendered perspectives on education, but many speakers have already spoken about this, so I won't touch on this further. What I do want to bring to attention is part of it is also decreasing the opportunity cost of education, because oftentimes, especially in developing countries, it's not just a case of there not being a school that provides quality education in the locality, it's that a child or, or someone who could potentially get an education or a higher degree wants to make money instead because the opportunity cost of spending time in education is so high. So governments need to also think about decreasing this opportunity cost and that includes through social policies, universal support systems, providing base levels of health, Many development economic policies and, and um, randomized control trials have shown that sometimes health is a stimulus for education because people, healthier children just tend to go to school more because there's less absenteeism. So this means that decreasing the opportunity cost of education, especially at national local levels, is not going to be solved with a universal policy, but rather requires investment in diagnostics of what is causing children in that locality to not go to school, so or to not go to university. And we can't just put a blanket policy on it and say, this is going to be the same for everyone from every youth constituency, um, from the global north, from the global south, from um, indigenous communities and whatnot, but rather investing in the diagnostics of what causes the lack of quality in their education. But also what we really want to see at the Transforming Education Summit is noting that it's about transforming and there's never going to be a time where we can say, ah, education is transformed, but rather it's a continuous process. And therefore, the outcome of the summit and what we really want to see in the youth declaration is a call for sustainability, is a call for continued entry points to engage with the conversation at the high levels of the UN. This means empowering country offices beyond the 2030 agenda because in, at 2030, you're only going to have some people graduating from schools. There's a whole other set of generations to come after that. That people can engage with the conversation continuously and with some level of ease without tokenism. And thirdly, engaging civil society champions across regions so that people know who to connect to if they want to express an opinion or view beyond this summit. And fourthly, and, and so on that third point, that includes, for example, um, a model of the climate advisory groups and climate task force that have been taking place quite successfully. So thinking of something similar from an education point of view. And fourthly, just transparency in the implementation process. Jay Altman mentioned scorecards as, as an example that's mental level. This might be through, for example, the youth office, it might be through an advisory group that set up call member states to say, tell us what you're doing after the summit, so that we can kind of support you from a civil society perspective, but also do our job in holding you accountable. And the very final thing is to say, Part of this declaration needs to also show a commitment from youth. I think young people have a fantastic tendency and frankly ability to call people to action. But I think sometimes what we need to do is also introspect and say, what are we as young people going to do in our education systems to set up the future of of education. And part of that is what people have mentioned of retweeting, calling universities accountable, but it means actually taking a moment to think about whether your yes, school is doing all, all that it can. 
I'm so sorry for taking more time, but thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you, Nodara, for your really important insights about the importance of tra transforming education. Does not only it finishes at the Transforming Education Summit, but also is something that it has to continue in time. So now we're going to pass to our next speaker, that is Shireen Omondi from the Global Student Forum. Um, please try to keep uh, to stay with the two minutes. Um, Shireen, uh, the floor is yours. Shireen, are you there? Okay, now we're going to pass to the next speaker because it apparently Shireen is not in the room. The next speaker is Josefa Tauli from Global Youth Biodiversity Network. So Josefa, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Sophia. My name is Sefa from the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. Um, and just to briefly introduce our network, it's a global coalition of young people um, who are working towards a society that's living in harmony with nature. And we're also the youth constituency to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, yeah, I wanted to use this space to bring some of the perspectives from our network because education, and particularly what we refer to as transformative education, it's a big priority. It came up in the wide consultations that we've been conducting since 2018. We agree wholeheartedly that education needs to be transformed, that we see education as really a key focus um, in addressing the biodiversity crisis, um, because this crisis is underpinned um, by values and behaviors and by relationships with nature that are largely shaped by education. Um, we believe that education should nurture connectedness with nature, it should be inclusive, it should be rights-based, and really celebrate diversity, um, like both biodiversity and cultural diversity, and it should really foster like critical and responsible citizenship, right? Um, as an Indigenous youth myself, I also want to emphasize that transforming education entails making sure that education is really culture-rooted, um, should be decolonized and even indigenized, and it should really support the self-determined um, transmission of indigenous and local knowledge um, that, as we know, is incredibly crucial to addressing the biodiversity and climate crises. Um, I won't repeat what has been said, but just to name some recommendations, we call for um, transformative education or for this vision of education that we as young people are building together for this to be um, integrated and reflected in local and national education policies, as well as international instruments on the environment. So um, the issue of education should not be siloed away from issues of the environment. And that's really a key point. Um, as the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, we're particularly calling for its inclusion in the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which is currently being negotiated under the CBD and is set to be adopted in December. And finally, we should make sure that um, uh, we should actively also support the education work that young people are already doing, um, also outside of school, so especially in non-formal education and making sure that these are attached to um, implementation mechanisms and accountability mechanisms. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Jose, for your important insights about rethinking our relations with nature to really be able to create a transformation in education. And now we're going to go to the third question. I'm going to pass the floor to Ulysses while I share my I share my screen. Well, perfect. Now again, before jumping in with the speakers. Please be in mind of the two minutes as we are running out of time, but you can also share your insights in the chat if you want to add anything else. Our last third and last question is, what are your commitments and actions towards transforming education? So I'm going to ask first to come to the floor, uh, Katy Alexandra Valoches Ruiz from the Movimiento Nacional Cimarron. Feel free to open your microphone. Buen día. Good morning, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're coming through, no problem. 
Okay, as far as the last question is concerned, uh, I teach uh, uh, Spanish and literature, and I would say that this issue is something that we've been working on in our association. That's to say, we are trying to extend knowledge of other cultures and eliminate ignorance about racism that is rooted in our society. And we haven't really been able to achieve that because the people in charge of education systems have not been aware of what's important. That's what we need to do to make sure the people at the top of the system are aware of that. Thank you. Teach us first. Uh, I'm going to move to the second speaker, which is Neil Shresta from the Blind Youth Association from Nepal, to take the floor. Yeah, thank you so much for this platform. So uh, I try my best to make my uh, sharing very short as much as possible. If you remember, uh, in in our last uh, pre summit held at uh, Paris, that I have also shared some of the things what the government or CSOs or other agencies can make give their efforts to ensure inclusive education or to take actions for the transformation of education. So here I'd like to highlight some things that I personally, I as a representative of, of the organization or I where I belong to as a professional or voluntary, what can we do? So first of all, we can uh, increase awareness among the stakeholders or among the general people. So today many people a uh, lot of people are not aware about how to ensure inclusive education for all groups, those belonging to uh, people with disabilities or other minority groups. So we can do strong awareness. Secondly, we can do advocacy, like uh, we can do advocacy for making accountable to all the government stakeholders, all the UN agency, or all the uh, CSS who have been taking action for the transformation of education or achieve uh, education agenda by 2030. Besides that, we can also work for uh, capacity buildings of the teachers or school representatives or let's say who have been working in the uh, transformation of the education so we can do efforts for them. And the next most important thing is that we can uh, do lots of social media campaigns or we can do fundraising activities so that we can reach out to the marginalized group who have been facing difficulties to access in the education just because of their uh, financial or I'm going to ask you if you can Problem. wrap up in so, the next few seconds. Yeah, please. that's the accent that we can take forward and very happy that uh, that's all from my end. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much. And now we're going to move to our last speaker. Uh, so I ask to join the stage, the virtual stage, Jan De Vanda from the IYLO. If you are there, feel free to unmute. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the interventions that all the youth have put forward. I'm going to make my intervention very short. And I think it's in terms of youth engagement. What we have seen is that all the young people who have been participating within the summit, especially within Paris and within New York, we're assuming is for, are from UNESCO. This is a secretary general summit. And we need all young people within the UN system in terms of youth coordination and engagement to be a part of the summit. We need an open call for young people to participate and to be funded and not a closed process that handpicks youth. This is very important. When we're speaking about education, we're speaking of centering the most marginalized. And when I say the most marginalized, I mean people who are not there to give sweet speeches. I mean girls who are on the move. I mean girls who are refugees. I mean girls who have been impacted by the education crisis, girls who have been a part of war, youth, adolescents who are part of truly marginalized communities need to be centered at the upcoming summit. This is essential. I want to emphasize that this summit 
government is an opportunity to get things right and get things right finally. And it's too urgent for us to risk not having a key strategy that UNESCO needs to produce to make sure that youth are put at the center and at the forefront of movements above just tweeting. Let me emphasize, we've tweeted enough. We've been tweeting for decades and decades and decades. We've been running social media campaigns, social media movements, everything about social media youth have mastered at the back of our heads. But we need member states and we need governments and we need ministers of education to make solid concrete commitments for education that focus and revolve around investments and funding for youth to be at the center of decision making. That is the only way that we move forward. We need to center gender transformative education systems and we need to focus an education system that takes a gender lens and puts climate education at the forefront. If we do not have these things, then we lose I'm the mark the same way we've been losing it shortly. for years and years. Thank you. That is what I wanted to say. But above all, we need accountability from UNESCO and we need accountability from the SG. If we don't have that, we lose everything. It starts with us, but most importantly, it starts with decision makers themselves. And we cannot put that on the back of, ya of youth. Thank you. thank you so much. And thank you for such a passionate and powerful speech. Thank you all of the speakers and all of the, all of the people in the chat sharing your thoughts, just to highlight us. Hello, I, I think uh, I was called in before, but my network was bad and I think it will only be, only be fair if I gave out my points. I don't know if that's okay. We are running out of time. If you can share it on the chat, that would be great because we're, we have to close the session in a few minutes and okay. we need to talk about next steps. But feel free to share it on the chat and they will be added as well to the youth declaration. Um, just as a final closing remarks, thank you for joining. It was great to hear from you. Just to highlight, many of you talked about a holistic approach, not only to talk about one thing, but how we can make it in a more interesting way, more evocative and more inclusive way for young people to be actually on the table. So I now pass the floor to Sofia for some final key remarks. Thank you very much, Ulysses. And it's really hard to give just one takeaway, one or two takeaways of this really incredible, inspiring session. We really wanted to create this, to organize this online consultation because as the UN Youth Envoy mentioned, we already be, did an, a consultation during the pre-summit, but that was in person and we really wanted to give the space for young people from all over the world to give their recommendations, their insights and their views. And I want to make to make emphasis on something that already the UN Youth Envoy said, that is that our advocacy it all, not only finishes at the UN, le UN levels or the high level spaces or this space as well, for example, that, but we also have to do more work when it comes to the ground, when it comes to starting conversations in our communities, because in order to transform education, if we really want for our governments to take bold commitments, we need to create more demand because there's not actions without, there are no changes without demand. And for in order to be more, to create a bigger demand, we need more young people. We need more young voices. We need to be louder and to be, to make this possible, we need more young people to join our movement. Today, I was able to hear all of you inspiring young people, young leaders that are changing your, your communities. You are already education advocates, but we need to be more in order to create structural changes. So I want to make emphasis on that, on how we can include more young people to our movement, to be louder and to be sure that we are included at the decision-making tables and that we are included and have a seat on the table on this educational transformation. Um, before sharing the next steps, I want to, to go back to Ulysses if he wants to share a final takeaway and then we will, okay, there it is. Ulysses is perfect then. Uh, then to wrap up, I want you to, to invite you is on the chat, the link of the Transforming Education Summit page and to invite you to, to look and dive into the Knowledge Hub because there are a lot of resources about there, about the action tracks, about all the work that has been done, about the pre-summit and you can use those tools to engage with your community as well. And another final and important thought is, is that we want to invite you to host grassroots consultations. This was an online and official consultation, but if you want to host, to conduct your own consultation in your community, in your country, yeah, the focal point to receive the reports of these consultations will be Ulysses, that is master of ceremony with me today. And we're going to share his, 
this email on the chat, but also you will be on the Knowledge Hub really soon too, so you can send the reports there. It only, it's really important only to remark that you can send the reports to July 28th as the latest. So thank you so much for being part of this session. It was really inspiring to hear you all and your thoughts on how to transform education. And thank you for all the your work you are doing in your communities. We will share more information in the Knowledge Hub. Just to mention, I left my email and my LinkedIn. So if you want to reach out regarding grassroots consultations, feel free to do it because there isn't much time left. So thank you all for joining and have a great day, afternoon or evening, whatever you are. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here.